Welcome once again to AIHA Connected, the AIHA's online patient conference. My name is Craig Lambert. I'm a hepatologist at Indiana University, but also the executive director for the AIHA. We think diet is incredibly important in health and disease, yet we have so much to learn about diet implications in autoimmune hepatitis. As you heard previously, if we draw conclusions from diet studies in other autoimmune diseases, it may be that the Mediterranean diet could be helpful in possibly controlling some inflammation, but also may help improve some symptoms. Other aspects of diet may also be important, such as avoiding high fructose corn syrup containing products. Our next speaker, Alex Smith, will try to help us better understand these different diet changes by highlighting some key aspects to remember when we're considering what to eat. Alec is a registered dietitian. He's also a certified strength and conditioning specialist and has been a strong advocate for the AIHA in the past. Alec, thank you for joining us again. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, happy to be back and talking uh, with the Autoimmune Hepatitis Association again. Uh, today, we will be discussing several aspects of nutrition uh, with a major focus on the Mediterranean diet. Uh, as they said, I am Alex Smith. I am a registered dietitian. A little bit more about me, I'm also a certified strength and conditioning specialist. Uh, I work mostly with clients in the one-on-one -on -one and small group uh, settings. We work both obviously from the nutrition standpoint as well as the exercise standpoint. That's the pretty shortened version, but the really shortened version I give people and without going into too much detail is uh, I, I simply knock cookies out of my client's hands for a living. And uh, that usually gets at least a little chuckle and they get an idea of sort of what I do um, in a nutshell. Uh, I do own Feel Good Nutrition and Fitness in Carmel, Indiana. And we've been in business now, uh, both in the nutrition and uh, exercise realm since March of 2010. So I, this March just crossed into uh, 10 years in the field. So uh, I got a little bit of experience behind me now. So let's just get right into it. You may be wondering, what is the Mediterranean diet? And it's actually, I was a little bit hesitant to going into this to really focus in on one particular diet because I'm not one to really say this is one, this is the one way for everyone to eat. Everyone should sort of find their own way. That being said, if there is one diet that I'm going to recommend to a vast majority of people, uh, one that scores high amongst the nutrition field uh, year after year after year, it is the Mediterranean diet. And I'll talk more about uh, why it's so good for you here in just a minute, but let's first talk about what exactly is the diet. So it's, if you think about it, it's mostly unprocessed whole foods. So stuff that grows up out of the ground, uh, comes from, is plucked from a tree, or maybe comes from the ocean. So your fruits and veggies, uh, obviously whole grains, nuts, seeds, legumes, olives and olive oil, uh, those are sort of your, your mainstays of this diet. Uh, there is uh, like occasional dairy. So think eggs, yogurt, some cheeses. Uh, we do have the occasional wine is actually a part of it. It's not not sort of like a caveat, it's actually included in the diet, although it is meant to be obviously drink in moderation. There is technically consumption of red meat. However, we're looking at maybe once a month at the most. Again, we're trying to eliminate some of these uh, saturated fats and other things that I'll discuss. And really avoiding just your processed, refined oils, processed foods, refined oils, your sodas, your, even your fruit juices, uh, things to that nature. I'm a big visual person. And so imagine yourself going around the grocery store and you've filled up your cart and now you're in the checkout aisle and you look down into your cart, you're about to put everything onto the belt. This should be about 80% of what you see. Now, what I would say is I'd probably minimize down the oil a little bit, as well as the nuts and seeds and probably expand out the beans and fruits and vegetables. But I wasn't quite tech technologically savvy enough to do that. So this is what we have. And since we're talking about foods that 
we want to include, I also have to include a list of foods that we want to mostly, I'll, I'll put an emphasis on mostly avoid because I don't believe in elimination. So obviously your fried foods, your sodas, your uh, cured meats and salamis that we process things, you know, hot dogs, bologna, salami, things like that. Sugary cereals, white bread, there's others, but this gives a pretty good uh, overview of what to limit, I should say. So now that we know what the diet includes and excludes, what is so great about it? And one of the first places I think a lot of people don't probably tend to think about is that this is a very satiating diet. There's a lot of good things about that word satiating. And I'll start with the fact that these are whole foods that are in general, maybe aside from the olive oil and nuts, difficult to overconsume just because of the sheer volume. There's a lot of fiber. There's a lot of healthy filling fats, things that fill you up before you reach a point of where you consume too many calories. So you can think of it this way. If I put a bowl of a big, you know, bowl of broccoli in front of you, that's going to be very dense in terms of how it's going to fill you up, but from a, or I'm sorry, from a calorie standpoint, very low. So we're looking at you know, a big bowl of broccoli, maybe hundred calories, and that's a big bowl. Whereas if I were to put a bowl of Doritos or whatever chip in front of you, it's very, it, there's, it's not very filling, it's very high in calorie, very easy to overconsume. So that's a pretty neat aspect about it. And one of the first things that generally pops into my mind. It's also a very heart healthy diet. So when you look at the fats that we're consuming, namely the omega-3s in the fatty fishes and the nuts and seeds, we know that these are types of foods that are good for the heart and therefore, uh, and also the elimination or, or minimization of saturated fats that are not so good for the heart. Uh, the diet may also help with uh, reducing inflammation, which when it comes to AIH, is always something to think about because we we have an, what I always consider to be an inflamed liver, and so it's it's fighting off uh, inflammation of the liver with all of the fruits and vegetables we're consuming, the micronutrients, and again those healthy fats. There's also research that suggests that this is a diet that may help with cognitive decline to slow it. And who doesn't want a stronger immune system? What you're doing is you're giving your body the types of foods and nutrients and vitamins and minerals and everything that it wants and needs to run at an optimal level. And that includes the immune system. So a lot of great stuff going on with this. And this is really the reason why, you know, if there is a diet that I'm going to recommend highly to a large number of people, you can see why. So more on the calorie control thing. One of the things we know, and I'm going to deviate just slightly from the Mediterranean diet here, is that if we can control calories, and by control calories, I mean eat at a slight deficit. So a maintenance calorie level would have you maintain your weight, a slight deficit, let's say by, you know, two or three or so hundred calories a day over the long period of time. So you're slowly dropping a little bit of weight. We know shows that you can improve things like uh, blood pressure cholesterol. Also, you can look at, we know that type 2 diabetes is linked with weight gain. You can have a longer life. I often like to say, you know, small dogs live longer. So longer life is good for everybody. And obviously a better quality of life. You, again, alluding back to what I talked about and putting the right types of the fuel into your body, uh, it's just going to run more optimally and less stress on the body. So whether or not you need to lose weight, we're at least decreasing inflammation, hopefully here. And if you do need to lose some weight, every step you take is just a little less stress on your body. If you happen to be a runner, I talk about running, actually, everybody thinks it's, it's two legs at once, but really it's, it's a single leg exercise repeated overall. So every time you land on that foot, you're putting all of your body weight plus, right? And it's just putting a big strain on the body. So all good things if we can, if we can control our calories and the Mediterranean diet is a great way to do that. 
And actually, I'm going to go back. So a great way to do that, because I think a lot of people think that they have to count their calories and weigh all their food. But if you're naturally eating foods that are relatively low in calories and very filling, especially with the high fiber content of the diet, there's not a lot of thought that has to go into, uh, you know, jotting everything down or plugging it, your foods into an app. Sometimes it can just come naturally. I wanted to do this talk so that you guys would have not only more information for your brain, uh, but also that you had that some tools that you could actually go out and use and put in uh, into this. So this would maybe be a good time to take a screenshot or, uh, or stop or pause, I suppose, the video. But I won't read through all of this, but again, uh, I showed you the list of, or I'm sorry, the pictures of everything, but this is the actual sort of list of everything that could go into your uh, grocery cart. So your fatty fish is your salmon, your mackerel. The tuna has an asterisk because uh, I like to limit that to like no more than two times per week for most people just to help eliminate the uh, crewing of mercury within the system. Try out sardines and anchovies if that's your thing. Those are actually pretty high up on the list. But we talk fatty fish, but it doesn't have to be all fatty fish. So if you're like, Alec, fatty fish is fine okay, every once in a while, but I really do love a crab cake. Hey, include that too. Shrimp, other things like that work as well. Fresh and frozen fruits and vegetables. Can can work in a pinch too. They're not quite as good, excuse me, um, due to they typically have added sodium to them. And really eat the rainbow is what we like to say. But if you if there's a handful of fresh fruits and vegetables that you really like and want to stick to, that's okay too. But I, I do recommend trying to sort of branch out and explore some new stuff. I say eat the rainbow because when you look at a fruit or a vegetable, you're actually seeing the color is the nutrition. You can actually see it, which is uh, still just such a cool phenomenon to me. So nuts, seeds, and legumes. I'm not going to go down that list. It's way too many. Uh, that's why I said, you know, it's something that you can print off. Uh, but I, I would like to point out that it is a long list. And so therefore, there's a lots of uh, options and combinations and, and things for you to uh, mess around with and, and try in the kitchen. Whole grains, obviously. I, even popcorn is on there. I think a lot of people don't realize popcorn is a whole grain. So we'll get to snacking here in a little bit. But I do um, popcorn, uh, assuming you're not coating it in butter and all sorts of other stuff uh, can actually be a pretty good snack. Again, if you, if you don't like quinoa and you're like, or, or oatmeal, but you like brown rice and barley, great, stick to those. Olives and olive oil, obviously is going to be a mainstay, namely extra virgin olive oil. Uh, avocados and avocado oil, which is something I personally have shifted to in the past couple of years away from when cooking high heat, we used to use canola oil, but I've switched to avocado oil, which has a, a higher smoke point, which essentially means you can bring it to a higher heat before it starts to quite literally smoke and it breaks down uh, the, the fat into a state that we're not looking for. So I do recommend olive oil for higher heat cooking. Herbs and spices, this is a really big one. I know it's just one little bullet point here, but this is a very underrated part of this diet as well. I've talked about all these foods, but ultimately I hope that this will lead to more cooking in the kitchen and you'll want to season things. And we're trying to get away from seasoning things with just salt and pepper, adding extra, you know, an unnecessary uh, fats, dressings, things of that nature. I really recommend adding a bunch of herbs and spices, not only for their health benefit, but you get a whole bunch of different flavors that you didn't even knew existed. And it's, it's, it's fun to explore. And certainly water should be the mainstay in terms of your fluid intake, but coffee and tea, we'll talk more about coffee here in a little bit. But coffee and tea work great as well. Again, you can have some milks or almond milks in there as um, to us, uh, excuse me, a certain extent, uh, but those should be the, the big three. And I, I added this because I thought, well, at this point, they're going to be thinking, oh, no, he's taken away everything I love and I can't follow this. There's no way I can stick to that. And I get you. So I love cake pie and ice cream, too. 
So I think it's important to remember, and this seemed like a good part, uh, part to put this in, it's not going to be perfect. It's you're, This isn't set in stone. It's not going to be every day, every single meal for the rest of your life. These should be included. In fact, data shows that if you completely eliminate these things from your diet, it can lead to binges later on. And that's the last thing we want to do is get you into disordered eating. So also tinker and toy around with this. So like I just talked about with the barley and you know, I don't like quinoa, but I like barley. Great. Stick with that. You don't have to include all of those. Um, little, uh, yeah, don't, no elimination. I, I, I like to talk about how it's not that food or, or product or whatever is, is good or bad. It's all about the dose. And so a little bit of pie and ice cream every now and then is probably, you know, I mean, it's good for the soul if nothing else. And so don't beat yourself up over it. If you can plan it, that's ideal. Uh, but with that last little note here saying po body's nerfix, this is important to point out. If you do quote unquote slip up and have pie and ice cream on a day you weren't or whatever it may be, might be cupcakes or whatever, don't fret over it. You haven't blown it. It, it means there's 3,500 calories in a pound. I, if you ate 3,500 calories, that's highly unlikely first and foremost. And even if you did, it's still just one pound. You haven't blown it. It, it. Don't let this derail the rest of your day, week, month. I've seen this too much in the past. You did it. There's nothing you can do about it now other than say, boy, that was good. And just get right back on track and do what you're doing. So this may seem a little bit like, whoa, this is a, this is completely different from how I currently eat. And maybe it's not, but for, I would imagine for a lot of you, you're thinking this is, he wants me to do what? I don't even like fish. So don't let this overwhelm you. So I think the tortoise and the hare, the, the tortoise, the slow tortoise, right? wins the race. So tinker around with this slowly add things in. This could be over weeks, months, even years. You don't have to, I, I don't even recommend changing everything all at once. So maybe right now you're eating white bread. Well, let's switch to whole grain for now. Maybe now you're drinking regular soda. Well, let's go to tea. Just really take your time into, into transitioning into this. I don't want this to just completely throw you off. You got your whole life to figure this out yet. So it doesn't have to happen overnight. And also your diet's not your identity. I threw this in because, you know, I hear people say, I am a vegetarian. I am a vegan. And I said, well, you eat a vegetarian diet, but that's not you necessarily. So just because you're eating a certain way, that's not your identity. You're just trying to look out for your health. This is in case anybody gives you anything, any flack for eating the certain way you do, because I know how that can come up in social situations. And then again, this goes back to, this doesn't have to be perfect. So yeah, the Mediterranean is, is a wonderful diet, but maybe you also, you like aspects of a more paleolithic diet, or as I just alluded to a more vegan diet, you can sort of do a combination of these and work around with it and make it fit your lifestyle. I'm, I'm not trying to completely tell you go from you know a to z here we can meet in the middle which i think has got to be like g or something i don't know <laughs> uh, more specifically now if you have aih you're probably familiar with fructose and added sugars but the difference is and in case you aren't aware uh, fructose is actually metabolized a little differently in the body and it, it kind of goes straight to the liver whereas glucose a more simple sugar, uh, goes into circulation, goes to the tissues that are going to use it. And so the liver is already kind of at a disadvantage. Adding fructose to the situation just kind of makes it worse. So this is where we want to limit these whenever possible. The good news is fruit, uh, which is obviously contains fructose, uh, is still on the table. We, uh, it's still a big part of this diet. There are a few that I, you may limit. We'll talk about that here in a minute but absolutely fruit is still on the table. The added sugars thing, there's a couple things to this. One is that 
the HFCS stands for high fructose corn syrup. You may see that on labels. Try to avoid that whenever possible, as well as table sugar. And I'll get into a little bit more of this later on. But when it comes to added sugars, it's not just about the fructose and, and the, the extra maintenance or work that it puts on your liver. But these are empty, quote unquote, empty calories. So if we're looking to, we, we know that losing weight helps our body in a myriad of ways. So if we can eliminate the added sugars, not only are we taking the stress off of our bodies, but we're eliminating the source of calories that are just really empty. And so I think anybody, regardless of if you have AIH or not, would benefit from hearing that. So when it comes to how to avoid, now you know what fructose is and the added sugars, where are they coming from? So obviously the first thing that comes to mind are your sugar sweetened beverages, your sodas, is, which is probably the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, candies, ice cream, certainly. I say fruit juice for the most part, because as, as I was putting this together, I thought, and that includes 100% fruit juices, by the way. I always tell people that if you can get your fruit, obtain it through the source itself. Uh, so instead of apple juice, have an apple. Uh, but as I was going through this, I thought of if you're maybe on vacation somewhere, say Florida, and you happen to pass some guy on the side of the street or the side of the road who's like hand cranking out fresh squeezed oranges from his orchard behind him, you should probably stop and get a glass because that's going to be worth it. But outside of that, try to limit it. Uh, the fruits that I do recommend, these are the higher fructose containing fruits, not that you need to not eat them by any stretch of the imagination, but I just wanted you to be aware that these tend to be a little bit higher in fructose. And those would be apples, grapes, watermelon. Obviously, your certain dried fruits, I have said cranberries, but you could throw raisins in there as well. Obviously, those are much easier to overeat because the sugar content hasn't changed, just the water content. So it doesn't take up as much volume in your stomach. And it's easy just to throw those back. So those can get out of control pretty quickly. Uh, some of the fruits I like the best are your berry, the berry group. If it ends in berries, it's usually a pretty good idea. So blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, raspberries, uh, and bananas are, are four of my, or the group that I like the best in terms of lower fructose. But again, all fruits are, all fruits are great. Just, I wanted you to be aware of that. And then also be aware that Fructose and hidden sugars are in so many things. One, because from the manufacturer's standpoint, it's really easy and cheap to add and it makes it taste good. So when reading labels, some things that come to mind would be like a ketchup bottle, salad dressings. There's, I mean, I could go on and on, but those are the first two that come to mind. Check out that ingredient list and look for things that's, you know, obviously sugar uh, would be one of them or any any add an adjective before the sugar. What type of sugar is it? It doesn't matter. They may make it sound really fancy, like organic, whatever sugar is still sugar. Uh, but fructose, high fructose corn syrup, or might say HFCS, uh, even honey, uh, agave syrup, molasses, coconut sugar. These are just examples of things to kind of be on the lookout for. They're able to get around it by putting fancy names on it, but that's manufacturers for you. So we talked about sweetener sweeteners. What about artificial sweeteners? And are they okay? And the truth is, I, I think they're fine in moderation, just like a lot of things. If you're downing, you know, a dozen diet sodas a day, yeah, let's cut back. But are they okay in moderation? Likely, yes. I, I often get the, the, the question about, well, I heard they cause cancer. And there has been research to technically say yes they can cause cancer but when you look at the data the the numbers are astronomical in terms of what you would have to consume uh, it, it, so basically if you're just having a couple every now and then or, or one every couple times a week or whatever don't worry about it you're going to be probably just fine and then there's also some talk out there about whether these artificial sweeteners trick the body into gaining weight i have not seen any data that makes that true. And actually all the data I've seen or have 
learned from going to conferences is that artificial sweeteners actually help with weight loss because most of the time you're going from say a regular soda to a diet soda. I think this would be a good time for me to remind you that earlier I said water should be number one and tea as well. And then we'll get to coffee here in a minute as well, but uh, likely okay in moderation. So I'm obviously going to find it in your diet drinks and diet sodas, but also in Anything that's going to be a lower calorie typically uh, from the store, so your baked goods, your lower calorie ice creams, although they do the double turn thing too, which is more about the molecule itself than adding artificial sweeteners. And again, salad dressings, low fat or, or low, I'm sorry, lower sugar or low fat yogurts, puddings, things like that. So snacking, this is a big one. I get lots of questions about, should I snack, should I not? If I do, what should I have, how much? And it comes back to, I think this became a really big thing in while I was shoot, still in school back in the early 2000s, when it was the six small meals a day thing and you were supposed to you know, stoke the metabolism by you know, throwing fuel on the fire every you know, two to three hours or whatever it was. We've pretty much debunked that um, and found that while people may have, some of us may have been having just that little snack in between, I think a lot of them actually ended up having, instead of six small meals a day, six meals a day. And so it sort of backfired on us. In general, the data tends to show that for most people, snacking, or I'm sorry, the absence of snacking, so not snacking is overall better for weight control. But I can't speak to everyone. And some people do prefer snacking and enjoy smaller meals. So if that's you, uh, I do recommend like a high density, low calorie when able. So like my, I talked about with that big bowl of broccoli earlier, it's going to fill you up on fewer calories. So obviously high fiber is a very filling component as is protein. I understand protein's not always available, but uh, if, if it is, then that's always a good thing to add. So a few examples would be say, and I say, I'll, emphasize small handful of mixed nuts because it's, you can very quickly go from, you know, a, a good snack is, you know, 100 to 200 calories for most people. And a small handful of nuts is probably going to land you about 150. However, if you have two or I'm sorry, three or four handfuls, which is relatively easy to do if you've ever sat down with a big tub of uh, mixed nuts, you can quickly approach four or 500 calories without really even thinking about it. So be mindful with, with snacking on those. However, great snack. Uh, I also really like, we've, I've toyed around with this myself is seasoning up a different ways, some spicy, some sweet uh, chickpeas and just roasting them in the oven. It's super simple and super delicious. It's super nutritious and fits right in with that high density relatively low calorie. A bowl of just mixed berries is great. Uh, another one would be assorted vegetables or the vegetable of your choice and dip that in some hummus. Again, going back to the chickpeas or, or sometimes they're called garbanzo beans. Homemade hummus is a great one to do. I hope some of you are able to pull up some recipes and try that out. We make some at home relatively frequently and it always turns out great. Obviously store-bought's fine too, but uh, it's fun to, to sort of toy around with that. Uh, as you know, a hallmark of autoimmune hepatitis is markedly low vitamin D levels in, in the majority of patients. So the first recommendation I would give out is I actually don't go to food first here as a, for a change. I say, you know, go outside and get some sun. We know that the sun's rays convert the vitamin, I'm sorry, the cholesterol in our skin into vitamin D, thereby making it active and allowing it to do its thing. That being said, um, if you're on certain medications, check with your doctor about that first in case you need to limit your sun exposure. Uh, but for a lot of people, this is a great way to go out and get the natural form of vitamin D. Unfortunately, and this is if there was a dermatologist in the room here with me, he'd probably be strangling me telling you to go out and get some sun. Uh, unfortunately, the wavelength of the sun's rays that convert the cholesterol in our, in our bodies to vitamin D is the same that causes skin cancer. So go out and get some sun, but not too much. And it's also important to think about where you live or your location. 
And so if you're living in northern Canada and not getting outside much, uh, the sun is less direct there and you're covered up half the year in, in pants and coats and hats and gloves, you're not going to be getting as much. And so you may want to be getting more forms from food and even supplements. Whereas if you live in you know, South Beach, Florida, and you own a boat operation, you're getting more than your fair share. So that's the first part, but there are foods that are high in vitamin D. I start with fish. Salmon is best. There are others, but uh, salmon is by far, at least in terms of uh, eaten amongst most of the people watching this video, that's pretty much the number one recommendation for me. And then, you know, finally, we get a chance for mushrooms to shine. No one ever talks about mushrooms, but hey, guess what? Portobello and white button mushrooms are very high in vitamin D. So give them their little, little bit there. And then obviously your fortified things such as milks, yogurts, um, some cereals and tofu uh, are a great way to get it. And eggs to a certain extent, they're a little bit on the lower end, but every little bit counts. And if you have an egg or two with breakfast, that's another way to get some uh, vitamin D. So I talked about vitamin D as a supplement. And before I get to that, I wanna talk about just supplements in general. There are tens of thousands or just a, a ton of them out there. And if they worked, you'd know about it. And I can probably count on one, maybe two hands or one and a half hands, the stuff out there that is actually does work and is worth your while. But the vast majority, 99% is just junk. And so don't waste your money on it. That's a very highly unregulated industry. You may read the label on a supplement and it may contain what's in there, what it says is in there. It may not, or, or it may only contain a small amount, or it may contain a whole lot more. It also may contain things, or it may have stuff in it that the label doesn't have on there. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's always a very sort of, at least early on, it was a very difficult area to navigate. Luckily, years ago, I found out about this independent company called, um, just, well, don't worry about the company. Look for this label. Uh, it's called NSF, and it typically says sport or certified sport or something like that. It's an organization that, again, it's a third party. They go through and they test all these different types of supplements, make sure they're actually claiming or going, you know, it says what's, what's in it is in it, and there's no contamination. You know, I often say, like the NFL uh, uses or goes by this or like dietitians within the NFL, uh, MLB you know, on the PGA tour, all sorts of things like that use this because, you know, these guys are on contract and if they get busted, you know, taking a supplement that had something in it and they get banned, you know, for four games and they lose, you know, millions of dollars. So this is a really, just look for the NSF logo. If you're buying supplements for the most part, that's a good way to go. Uh, as for AIH, really there's two, obviously the vitamin D, uh, look for vitamin D3, that's the active form of vitamin D. You may see some that say vitamin D2, you want the vitamin D3. And what you'll see on it is it will typically say IU, which stands for international units, as you can see here. Uh, the recommendation or the recommended dietary allowment uh, per day is 800 international units. I personally think that's low. And if you're already low, you're likely safe. I mean, and some of you watching this may even be, be prescribed, you know, a 2000, a 5,000 or even a 10,000 IU daily. Uh, obviously that's something to talk about with your doctor, but I'm pretty confident in recommending 800 to a thousand IUs. Um, I would, I, I wish that would go up, um, but that's what the RDA is for now. And so that's what I'm going to go by. And also for you, I've, been, I've talked a lot about fatty fish and things like that. And some of you may be thinking, oh, fish, that's, I hate the fishy smell or the taste, or I just don't enjoy fish, but still want to get the benefits from the omega-3s in that fish. You can supplement fish oil or krill oil is another type. Um, what's, it, it will never replace, supplements will never replace food. If you can always get something from food, it's always going to be a better way to do it. But this is better than nothing. And 
I've had people tell me they don't like the fish burps. So if you take a fish oil, uh, you may have a you know burp down the road and it, you then taste the fish. You're like, this is what I was trying to eliminate altogether in the first place. Uh, you can freeze them and that helps to uh, sort of put that at bay. So just a little tip there. Oh, and in terms of, I'm sorry, uh, dosage, you're looking at, you know, maybe one, one to two grams or 1,000 to uh, two, maybe 2,000 milligrams a day. Water. It's, we talk about it. We say, yeah, make sure to drink water. And then we just sort of put it to the side. But this is a really, really, really crucial part of not just the Mediterranean diet, but just a healthy lifestyle. I like to talk about, I own a gym as well. And so everyone's talking about, you know, building muscle. And I say, well, a hydrated, a hydrated cell is an anabolic cell. And, and anabolic, it comes from the, the word anabolism, which simply means to build or to grow. And so it also means it's metabolically active. So when we're dehydrated, I, I wanted to include this. Think of like, if you forgot to water your plant for four or five days, it's wilted. It's it's lethargic, right? The plant looks bleh, right? And that may be how you feel. And so maybe if there's, maybe, maybe none of this has been relevant to you so far, but you go, oh, I need to drink more water. I highly recommend if you're not drinking enough that is allowing you to, or, or causing you to uh, use the restroom about every two to three hours and has your urine is a very pale yellow color, which is a good indication. The darker it is, the more uh, dehydrated you tend to be. A caveat to that might be if you're taking extra water soluble vitamins, so lots of B vitamins, vitamin C, things like that, or a, a multivitamin or a B complex. And then uh, you, you'll find that it's actually more of a neon style yellow. That's simply you're, you're, you're urinating away those uh, vitamins. So, but in general, you want a pale yellow. Uh, urine stream and every two to three hours going to uh, the restroom. I, I sometimes say half your body weight in ounces of fluid, but that doesn't work for everyone. So, I mean, if you're, if you weigh 350 pounds, you know, we're probably going a little bit on the high side there. So it's, it's a reasonable way to go about it, but I, I really like to go with it. I'll let you sort of self-regulate and I go with that, you know, using the restroom every two to three hours and pale yellow urine. And I say fluid, I didn't say, you know, half your body weight in ounces of water because coffee counts, as does tea, as does uh, your fruits and vegetables. If, if you're containing, or I'm sorry, if you're consuming a, a good majority of fruits and vegetables throughout the day, that can be 15 to 20% of your fluid intake. And I think a lot of people sort of forget about that. So all of these things add up and count. It doesn't just have to be water. Now, I will say if, if you're going to be including coffee with that or, or even tea, uh, thinking about the additives to it. So you may be adding uh, a creamer or something like that to it, which would add calories. So that's something to think about. Uh, also, there's a upper limit of caffeine for most people. Everyone's tolerance is a little bit different, but you can have too much caffeine. It can cause some mild discomfort, some jitters, uh, some shakiness, some anxiety, stuff that's really uncomfortable. And so if you've seen anything in, or heard Dr. Lewis talk about coffee and the health of uh, or improving the health of the liver, uh, you can go with decaf coffee. So maybe throughout the day, you have, you know, your cup of coffee in the morning, fully caffeinated. So I'm not saying you have to give up caffeine altogether. I believe that's what he said in his talk, uh, which, which is fine too. Uh, but I'm saying you don't have to, you could have a cup or two of, of your regular coffee. And then maybe mid afternoon, you have a cup of decaf and that's, it, it's a little different from water. It's different from tea and maybe you just like the taste. And it also may uh, help with uh, improving liver health. So all good things here. Now, all of those things said, I would be remiss if I were to not include the last few slides. I am, uh, of course, a, a strength and conditioning coach as well. And if we're talking overall health, I have, to, I have to put this in. So if there was this magic pill that did all of these things on the screen here for you, I mean, I think 
even the most healthy person on earth would go, yeah, I'll take that. Why not? If anything, it's decreased depression and anxiety, increased energy levels, better sleep. I think everyone would take that amongst the other things. Well, we don't have a pill for that, uh, but we do. It's called exercise. And here's the cool part. It can be anything you want. Matter of fact, it should be anything you want. You don't have to go in and have a buy a gym membership. And I own a gym and, you know, sign up for personal training sessions and things like that. You can just go out in your yard and use the push mower. I mean, you can so exercise. Maybe if you're working it in that way, or maybe you're just playing with the kids in the yard. I thought this was a good photo for like, this should be fun. Don't, don't force yourself into, if you hate running, don't run. If you enjoy swimming, go swim. So it's, again, I'm going to go back to that slide because I think it's, that's a really, I mean, even if I just included two of those, I think everyone would take that pill and any two, pick any two. And so it really is exercise really is the, the fountain of youth, so to speak. It, it does so much for us. So I got to put that in there. I'm not going to get into the details of, you know, make sure you get X amount of minutes per day and at this level of intensity and get out and move uh, and have fun with it. We'll just keep it as simple as that. So I think I started this off by saying I've been doing this now for, I can tell we're past March, right? So I can say now um, a little over 10 years and I worked with a lot of clients and it really boils down to, in terms of, you know, sticking to the Mediterranean diet, sticking to the exercise program, or, or it really basically you have to be consistent with it. It must be enjoyed. And that especially goes for the nutrition side. I know I said, I want you to enjoy exercise, but sometimes exercise stinks. It's hard and you're sweating. You're like, ah, uh, but diet should be definitely be something you enjoy. If you don't enjoy it, there's no way you're going to continue doing it. And I found it needs to be habit-based because habit-based is probably the most important thing because when you don't feel like doing it, you do it anyway when it's habit-based. And that leads to adherence. So with any diet that you're on, be it, you know, right now what's hot is, I think keto is still hot right now. I'll maybe watch this video in five years and that will be a complete thing of the past and we'll be on to something else. But if it's something that you can't see yourself doing that for a week, a month, five years, 10 years, et cetera, then you really need to reanalyze what you're doing here. And, and I'll, I'll go back to what I said earlier with the Mediterranean diet. You don't have to do this Mediterranean diet exactly as I've, I've, I've you know, drawn up here for you. You can add aspects of other things to it, or you can, or you can take little bits and pieces of that and add it to what you're currently doing. So there's a lot of ways to do this. Obviously, the more Mediterranean style seems to be, at least from a, an IBD standpoint, which is an AIH, uh, but not, both autoimmune nonetheless, uh, seems to be pretty beneficial. Hopefully, we'll get more data on this in the future. But uh, you can do this. And again, if you can keep this habit based, it will help you adhere to it and make sure you enjoy it and get out there and get after it. So, so thank you. Uh, that is my talk for the 2021 version of the AIH conference. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be on here. I hope that you were able to take some information away from this and hopefully it'll help with be it maybe it's fatigue, lethargy, joint pain, whatever you may be experiencing, hopefully changing some things in your diet uh, will help you. So thanks.